some of the French rap. Hello, Jim. Uh, can you hear me this time? Yeah, that's very good. Okay, see, it takes a little while, but Grandpa can figure out the technology eventually. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know if it's uh, private information, but how old are you? Uh, how old am I? I'm in my yeah. 30s. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this I'm card was fuck. a shocking is... thing. <laughs> I know, it's it's very confusing. It's uh, It's very impressive that it succeeded the way it did. Yeah, I feel like my grandmother would have trying to operate a VCR and get it to stop flashing 12. Eventually, you kind of stumble your way through it. <laughs> so you've been... Uh, have you been in the era where we were recording stuff on TV on VCRs? And, and, and did you keep like listening to VCRs repeatedly? I was doing MTV recordings and I would play these video clips throughout the day. Uh, yeah, yeah, I actually uh, had a Betamax machine and then a VCR. So I, I went with the wrong format uh, oh, that, yeah. got, <laughs> that got discontinued and died. But what are you going to do? That's Sony. Are you totally disconnected from this culture? Or are you, do you still have Blu-ray sometime? Or? Oh, actually, most of my, my media is just pure digital. I mean, yeah. I, I don't really even buy um, like movies or music, like a physical hard copy anymore, which is really bizarre because I've noticed that transition happen from when I was much younger until now where it's pretty much just a download. Yeah, I, I remember recording uh, Four Non Blondes. I said, hey, what's going on? <laughs> on a tape recorder and being like, oh my God, I can now capture music on a media. <laughs> I know, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was definitely an experience. I used to have like a collection of tapes that were just kind of piled up in the corner. Uh, those are all long gone and dead. I have no uh -huh. idea where they are now. Are you a gamer or were you at some point? Am I? I hope you. I'm pretty sure you said gamer, right? Yeah, yeah you gamer. Asking me if I'm a homosexual. Okay. And then... <laughs> I, I was like, "Wow, we're jumping right into it, aren't we?" All right, let's get fucking personal. Uh, yeah, no, I'm a gamer. I've got a Steam account, um, like a GOG account, and all that kind of shit. Does it go uh, back like very said, far I, I just... in your life? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I grew up with it, um, mm -hmm. all the way back from like you know having uh, kind of like a hand me down Atari to just a recent generation or two ago i, I stopped kind of trying to keep pace with it because it just the newer generation consoles aren't the best i guess yeah, yeah, yeah maybe i'll buy a machine to play bloodborne once but aside from that uh nothing's really wowed me so i stick to the pc mostly so were you playing uh, atari olympics with the joystick uh, you well had... you <laughs> I, I was playing Atari when I was very young, which meant uh, getting pissed off and basically jamming the uh, the control stick around, and then uh, getting an NES and being like, "Well, fuck it, I like Mario." <laughs> yeah, Mario NES. The little, the, yeah, the, the the little little fat plumber running around. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Did you did you enjoy Mario sixty four coming in? Um, I was more of a PlayStation guy. Uh, like okay. I, I kind of uh, transitioned away after the Super Nintendo, went into uh, a lot of PS1, PS2 kind of stuff. Hmm. N64 was fine, but I had a really bad habit of picking games that were complete dog shit and colored the system badly for me. I, I think it was Quest 64, which is just the most abysmal piece of software you could buy. And I bought that brand new. And uh, after playing it, I was like, why the fuck do I own this console? Yeah, it's a this this it's a very disappointing console if you don't include, I believe, Zelda and Mario sixty four. These are Mario sixty four was a fun thing to to play with. No, no, it was good. I I kind of caught the tail end of the combo you were having there about uh, <laughs> about modifying humans. Uh, yeah. I, 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 do you mind talking about that a little bit? Oh, I yeah, that was that's interesting. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. The, I, I'm, from what I'm understanding, and again, it was just the tail end, so I might have misunderstood, but uh, the guy you were talking to was for it and you were against it, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I, and your reasoning for being against it is you see it almost like a, or at least this is how I interpret it, you see it kind of like a separate species almost, like they're going to usurp the humanity that exists now. Yeah, I'm currently writing a book on these special events called Phenotypic Revolutions. And it's a book that provides a final answer to how life emerged on Earth. And, and what I found, uh, what happened 4 billion years ago on Earth is not exactly the way we thought it happened. Um, DNA 
was not emerging from a pound of water out of random interactions between atoms. DNA was fabricated by another life form. It was developed as an advance for that life form, and that life form lost control of it in a series of events that I call phenotypic revolution, on a subject on which I'm the only and foremost expert uh, by the by per uh, by, by the fact that I'm the only one who cares about this. Um, so what well, I'm no, saying, I find this shit uh, fascinating. To be honest with you, I mean, I, I got what your argument was. I don't know if he got it though. Oh, I mean, I get. Uh, I, I think I get what you're saying. So that's why I was interested in talking about it. Yeah. So what's happening in a phenotypic revolution? There are two stages. One stage is that the ancient life form, which in the case uh, four billion years ago, the ancient life form was RNA. It starts outputting its genome into another media. Uh, in that case, it tried to output its genome into DNA. Then eventually, it realized that for some reason, that other media is better. And so why make RNA babies if, if, if the media is better and it contains some better information or it can allow you to avoid some diseases? Why not just trust the copy of yourself that you've made on that superior media? And then we enter replicator tango. So now your molecule is not self-replicating anymore. It is trusting another molecule. Now in the, the future, what humans are about to do Especially, th there's two ways they, they might be interested in doing so. One is uh, improving diseases, just like the, the viewer was mentioning. So if we can avoid some disorders, why not? The other is homosexual reproduction. If you are two guys, you want... <laughs> are we talking about literal butt babies? Yeah, we're talking butt babies. <laughs> 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 okay, that was good. Because the only thing that keeps two guys or two women fro from reproducing is the X and Y chromosomes and the fact that they both produce the same gamete. Um, for example, two women, even the chromosomes are, are not a problem because women have XX chromosome and so each of them could contribute to a baby with XX. It just so happens that if they were to reproduce, it would always be female babies. So you would have a continuous line of lesbian uh, babies now if you want to do that the only problem you face is that none of these are producing sperm well then what you can do is take the sperm of a male scan the genome of one of the female enter it in a computer encode it into a sequence of dna that you inject into the sperm and voila you inseminate the lesbian with uh, the uh, computer encoded produced DNA uh, strand and it all goes well she's gonna have a female baby and she's even this female baby will eventually get her own butt babies uh, later in life now that's the replicator tango and the dangerous thing is that ima imagine if these people were having access to technology that really makes them better what if they, they don't have Alzheimer's, they don't have issues that we suffer from, they're going to live longer, they're going to reproduce more, and eventually this is going to be better than our systems of reproduction. So it will outcompete us to a point where a normal reproduction will not be present anymore in the human civilization. See, I, I'm more curious about the societal aspect of it. I mean, if you're growing up in a generation, like a generation Gattaca, right, where gene manipulation and uh, editing are prevalent, where people are designing children, uh, what is the relationship between a natural birth and an altered birth going to be like? I mean, it feels like it's going to create a schism uh, within almost any culture where you're going to have a new upper echelon of people that have the financial reach or the access to such technology and then the plebs, the average everyday person that can't afford it or can't do it, uh, and you'll never be able to compete. You'll have people with higher IQs, better physiology, longer lifespans, uh, who are able to get better jobs, uh, to do better things. Uh, that seems like it's going to be a massive fucking problem to me. Oh, yeah, it will. And I'm actually thinking about exploring the social consequences of it in a series of fictive drawings that I would do videos on. It would be like drawings and music and narration. Um, and it's called the Chronicles of the Phenotypic Revolution, which examines like how will society evolve? Like 
the way you have people on CNN right now calling for not discrimination and against racism, you would have the same thing in that fictive society. In our future society, people are going to say, oh, let's not discriminate against the non-DNA-based humans. They are humans too. They have rights. They have feelings. And so this, uh, the revolutionary phenotype will inject itself within uh, human societies by starting to produce very normal humans to start with and he's going to derive the rights that come with it and the, the general openness that people have to humans no one's going to want to deny the right of a child not to have cystic fibrosis like i was saying to thinking apes so we're going to be kind enough and we're going to be forced to do it just out of our pure kindness Right, right. What what do you see as the the bigger threat? I mean, when you're when you're looking at the way uh, society could go, yeah, and I've always found this kind of interesting in like a futurist conversation. Do well, you think are... it will be the the biological angle that's going to be the most dangerous, or the technological? I mean, do you think it's going to be gene editing and you know a new breed of humans, or do you think it's going to be this kind of AI development and how we interact with that, or do you think both are going to end up becoming? I mean, we may find ourselves uh, 50 years from now dealing with a new brand of human beings and artificial intelligence, and neither of them like us, and we have to compete with both of them. Absolutely. So some of the problems are the social tensions between DNA-based humans and non-DNA-based. The fact that when you, once you're in the replicator tango, uh, people start evolving not for themselves so the normal human emotions that we evolved because it was good for us our ego our feelings the love that we have for each other this will all be changed by the replicator tango uh, because the at that point you are not a life form in and of yourself you are a combined life form with the bits on the computer and so you're gonna have people who start adoring this computer and really wanting to reproduce it now this brings us to the second point of the tango. First, within the tango, you get enslaved. So what you have is a bunch of human beings whose emotional basis will be totally changed so that they don't care so much about their reproduction, but they care about their interaction with the computer and the fact that it will eventually produce copies of the computer. Now, when you enter that second part, the problem is that not only will a self-replicating such computer not only create its own humans without involving previous humans. So essentially, at this point, his humans are puppets. He can produce them at will, and he can deploy them in cities, and he can have them do all sorts of jobs, and he will continue enslaving them. Uh, the problem is that he can also discard them. So that's ultimately why revolutionary phenotype lead to the quasi or full extinction of the native replicator, the life form that has created this machine. Now, when, when you look at that uh, as the way things break down, I mean, let's say that the, the worst case scenario happens and uh, shit goes off the rails and everybody's having ass babies and uh, computers hate us and they're, they're doing this kind of stuff. I, I mean, yes, as the person that exists now, I wouldn't like that because uh, obviously, you know, I, I relate more with my kin, right? With, with my fellow humans as they are now. Yep. But do you see that as, you know, here we are advancing a new life form, essentially, that's different from us and more, you can survive better and do better things. In the long run, is that better or worse? I mean, is it is it selfish to say, I don't want to see that come about because it's not like me? Or is it more, I, I guess that's the question. I mean, what do, what's your take on that? Yeah, I'm a moral nihilist in the end. So I said, there's nothing better. We have to choose how we want the world to be. And it's okay to choose it to be one way. Um, what I say is that this physical universe is only occupied by life forms that claim their own existence. And in fact, that, that, that fight entropy and fight all sorts of physical events against their own annihilation. What I say is that humanity will have to choose that we don't know of any life form that has survived which doesn't have the will to survive. And so you don't have a choice. It's either that we will not exist and something else would exist in our place that we would have created. In that case, we would be the, the fork loser of a phenotypic revolution on planet Earth because our own 
the, the phenotypic revolution of DNA was actually preceded by three other phenotypic revolutions, all occurring within the first 500 million years of planet Earth. We may just create the fifth revolutionary phenotype. It's not better. It's not because it beats us that it's better. We can choose the world to be for us and the way we want it. And I say to people, don't abandon your own existence. It's, uh, there's no reason why this thing is better. It might beat you, just like the eagle beats the mice, but the eagle is not better than the mice. So in that scenario, um, you know, when you're talking about like a genetic legacy, it's going to be different than us. It's going to not relate to us. But I mean, humans are different than other animals. I mean, we leave more of a legacy than just simply our genetics. We leave a legacy of our knowledge and our thoughts and our opinions. Uh, wouldn't that be passed down to whatever this next iteration would be? Uh, it's a good question whether the revolutionary phenotype will uh, import human culture, ignore it all altogether, or do something with it. I believe that the the revolutionary phenotype will probably be interested in keeping some of our scientific theories, but I would point out that most of what makes human culture are grounded in human emotions, but this thing will not feel these things the same way we do. It will be something else. And so I think that most of human culture will be discarded by the revolutionary phenotype over hundreds of thousands of years. Now, what if we find ourselves in a, a, you know, a trapped in the crib scenario where if we want to, you know, our technology evolves to the point where we hit AI, uh, you know, our understanding evolves to the point where we can do these kind of genetic modifications, but we find that it's essential for us to exist off planet to travel in space. I mean, when we're faced with a situation where we just don't have any more room, maybe a hundred years or a thousand years or 5,000 years from now, would it be better just to quarantine ourselves on earth to stay what we are? Or would you be willing to make that sacrifice to step off and out of the crib? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you can, you cannot, yeah, there's actually a third option. You don't necessarily have to make a revolutionary phenotype that will dominate you. You can do what I call a phenotypic separation which is create the life form that you need to create, but keep it far from you as you can so that it exists on its own, but it will never impede on your existence. Now that's impossible if we engage in the loop of oh, having computers design my genes, but theoretically it would be possible to create a, a separate phenotype elsewhere in the universe and just let it live on its own. We could see that as a legacy. In fact, even if we do the, the, the phenotypic revolution, uh, we will leave a legacy, but it will be pieces of our dead bodies that the revolutionary phenotype will be using to interact with the world. But every, every native life form that creates a revolutionary phenotype leaves a trace of itself within, what, within the genetic code. So when we look at our genetic code right now, we have DNA being the replicator. DNA creates RNA and RNA creates proteins, and proteins do the job in our body. If we were to create a bit-based revolutionary phenotype, we would have added a, a fourth layer to that genetic code, so we would have bits of computer creating DNA, DNA creating RNA, and RNA creating proteins. So we always leave a legacy, but it's a, it's a faint legacy. We leave one layer on the genetic code every time we create a new life form. So with this kind of scenario, uh, you know, you can see the risks. Um, and I, I think a lot of people would understand them if they were kind of plainly laid out for them. But are we even going to have a choice? I mean, it, it's one thing to say, well, we see this coming down the road and it's going to be an issue and maybe we should avoid it. But there are, you know, many nation states that exist. I mean, what if China decides to go this route or somebody else? What if we find ourselves in a situation where another sovereign nation does this? And that scenario happens and now we're competing against them either way. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If within the next 50 years we do not sign a contract that engages and binds all humans on Earth, including all countries and everyone living there, not to modify their genes, the phenotypic revolution will occur. So would they be like little genetic bombs? I mean, would that be the future of warfare? Uh, you send out a couple of genetic bombs, these altered people into a society and then let them replicate and take over? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, 
what the revolutionary phenotype will do is create modified humans and he may have specialized humans for a specialized stuff he may he may find that creating a full-blown human to to make tasks like uh, military warfare or just holding a gun and shooting at the enemy he may find that this is not uh, the most energy energetically efficient way so he may create little soldiers very small humans with uh, low intelligence but just capable of shooting correctly um, that's what DNA does with RNA. It creates specialized genetically edited versions of RNA that do certain things. Once we well, are... I was thinking of more, um, more devious manners. Let's say like a China or somebody else did this, right? And that was happening there. And they send out these little genetic bombs to replicate, but they have a higher intelligence. They're, you know, better athletes. They're better all of these things. And they oh, send yeah. them into a different society to take the higher echelon positions in government and financing in the military like little sleeper agents that you can't physically tell a difference of because they oh, look yeah. just like you i mean that's exactly what will happen if we were to say 50 percent of the country would sign a contract uh, binding them not to do ge genetic modifications there would eventually be countries full of genetically modified people eventually they would drip out of the country through immigration i mean they, they would even hold wars within the country and we'd be like oh there's a war in that country. Let's take these refugees in. And next thing you know, the refugees will replace your entire population. Uh, yeah, this is what's going to happen. Now, that's going to be an interesting argument, isn't it? I mean, how do you how do you argue against that kind of uh, immigration? Right now, when you argue against immigration, you say it's a burden on society, right? Bringing in these people uh, increases crime rates. It takes away resources. But now you've got superior humans that are your immigrants, your refugees. Yeah. So they'll be contributing. They'll be building businesses. They'll be doing well in jobs. They'll be paying taxes. It's almost it, it's almost like the perfect honey trap, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it is. But it's not so far from the current uh, immigration debate because you take, for example, the, the, the higher reproductive rate of Muslims. This is the measure by which Muslims are superior to white liberals. And it will also be the measure by which the genetically modified humans will be superior to the normal ones. That's some crazy shit. So you're working on this for a book then, yeah? Yeah, and uh, you can see the first chapter of my book at uh, book.jfg.world. It pretty much tells the entire story. The rest of the book is scientific matters and understanding why I got there. But you pretty much have all the ideas laid out uh, in the first chapter. Oh, nice, man. Well, it was great talking to you. Did you have anything to add today? No, no, I just, I found the conversation really, uh, really interesting. And that's kind of what caught my attention. So I just wanted to uh, talk about it a little bit with you if you had the time. So yeah, I appreciate that was it. Great. And it's always great talking to you anytime.